<laughs> We're here. Hi, guys. We're here. Sorry about the late start. Holy crap, that's never happened. And we haven't had so many people <laughs> signed up for our AI Live ever uh, because everybody wants to hear about occlusion management. But we got a new computer at AI, and um, it wasn't working right. So, so sorry. Yeah. Technical difficulties. We're so sorry. Thank <laughs> goodness our <laughs> IT people are on it, and we weren't fixing it because we would still not be with you. But no. thank you so much for hanging in I there. Know. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a great topic for tonight. I know. Dear, near and dear to our hearts, I, of yeah. course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. But I think we have a uh, few little things that we need to uh, talk about first. We do. Like what you have? What have you been up to, <laughs> Lori? <laughs> you know what? We, we're just talking. Like we we were in London, middle of May. Yeah. We um, to be at a conference there and, and that was last month that I'm like what did I do this like in the last few weeks and I'm like mm, I just kind of I went to Arizona did some trainings but I kind of have Work. not done anything Work. exciting Work. but you on the other <laughs> hand I did tell them what you I where you was were just on vacation at. that's where this nice tan I know, is from um, I went to was it London and then I went to Greece Mykonos and Santorini beautiful beautiful Guys, if you haven't been there, got to go check it out. <laughs> check it so out. <laughs> so you know what? Tell them tell what you, you like. Did you buy anything there? Uh, uh, <laughs> if you followed <laughs> on Instagram, you probably saw <laughs> bad, Gucci, bad, Christian bad, Dior, bad. Louis Vuitton. I mean, the thing is, if you guys don't realize it, I mean, the dollar is pretty much on par yeah. with the U.S. dollar and euro. So you it's already cheaper there. And then you get your VAT tax back. So you're saving like a, do a purse, women, <laughs> my sister in law. Um, you, it's like three, four thousand dollars here. You're probably paying like twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars cheaper after everything right now. So, so you didn't spend a lot of money. You saved a I lot of money. I saved a ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I think. That's I'm the way you all go on over vacation. that. It's all about saving money. I'm all over that. I love it. No, but it was great. It was great. All right. So we have a little PowerPoint to go through. All right. So here we go. Um, our occlusion management. Of course, this There's is our disclaimer. Our disclaimer. It's for education. <laughs> this is Lori's education, Let's my see. education, and here we go. Okay, so when we have an issue, when we think there is an arterial occlusion, and I'm not talking about venous occlusions because those can happen also, but when we have an arterial occlusion that's not visual, we are going to be looking and assessing for patients. Now, keep in mind that th there might be not be anything. There might not be any blanching. There might yep. You might not see anything, yep. and the patient leaves your office, and 12 hours later, they get blanching. Yep. That's possible. Or you can get a little bit of blanching when you inject, like the, the area turns white, and then it turns pink again. You're like, wow, I was lucky there. That can still be an occlusion. So it's really important that we are aware of these immediate and delayed occlusive events and how it works in the body so that we, are, we can educate our patients. Right. Now, every single patient, every single patient I do fillers on, they get an aftercare filler care sheet that I have. This is a card that I, get, that I give them that tells them what to look for, what signs to look for, has my office number and my Google number on it. So I know that everybody I inject can always get a hold of me because what if you are closed? What if you're not there over a weekend or the office is closed? Mm -hmm. Where's that patient gonna go? The emergency room, They're ER docs know. don't know how to mm -hmm. manage it and they don't, <coughs> they don't have Hylinex. Nope. So make sure that your patients are very, very well informed on what to look for because they are your eyes and ears when they leave your clinic. And I believe that wholeheartedly that nope. they are the ones that are gonna help me get out of trouble if there's a problem. It's very true. I mean, the, the two that I've had over like 18 years of injecting, um, both of them did not blanch right away. Mm you know, one of them, maybe I could say, maybe I thought there's this, you get this gut feeling like, Neh. but both of them didn't blanch and both of them was something that progressed over the next 12 hours. And so they reached out and said, this is a little odd. What do you think? And I'm like, mm, come in. You know, I think you, you have to teach your staff. If you have staff in the front that's answering phones, you know, you need to tell them how to delineate what is going to be someone you want to bring in, what could potentially just be a patient who is a little overly zealous about um, something that's being ha that's happening. 
But I mean, ultimately, I think making sure that you, you have some access, as Lori says, whether it is uh, your even your Instagram DMing you with a picture. You know, I think most of us out there probably have an Instagram. I think that's a great way to let your patients know, hey, if you really have anything, please DM me because most of us are obsessed with our Instagram They're on it all the time. <laughs> We're not obsessed. We just have nobody helping us with it. Oh, well, I don't. You do. Hey, I still, I still check out my DMs. <laughs> but, I mean, you want them to send you a picture so that you're at least cognizant, okay, what's going on? You can kind of walk them through. Checking capillary refill. I think that's to me a good sign. If you tell them to check their nail bed, see how fast that bl that blanching um, goes away from the capillary refilling, and then check the areas that they're concerned with and push down. And it's not a quick push. It's a really hold for three, four, or five seconds, and then relax it and see how quickly blood flow falls back into the area and. If it's slower than you think, bring them in, evaluate them. It doesn't mean, you know, that it really is. It could be just they're maybe a little slower, but ultimately you're going to maybe check side by side and compare yeah. one side versus the other side to give you a uh, control versus this is maybe not what I'm expecting and maybe I should be dealing with something like that. Yeah, and I think I think that's mm. a, that point that he just said is paramount. Assess both sides simultaneously. So if you have something that looks like there's paleness or something to one side, press down on both hard for probably a good 10 seconds. And when you let go, look for capillary refill on both sides. Yep. Make sure that that looks pretty e um, equal. And you can do it a couple times. And if you're concerned at all, dissolve. When in doubt, dissolve. If you've I put a filler in that you can dissolve. Yeah. And remember, it's not just going to be in the area that you injected. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will tell you the one um that i did get was in the nasolabial fold and it was 0.05 yeah i said like a 0.05 was the last bit i was dropping the, <laughs> the syringe into the sharps container and the patient's like nope don't waste that don't waste that fine put it somewhere and <laughs> just literally where do you want it oh right here okay just stuffed it in there um nothing didn't see anything when she walked out of the clinic everything looked fine and literally 12 hours later, there was a levito that went all the way to the tip of her nose, all the way through to kind of the mid bridge area, down through the nasal labial fold, down through slightly down through here. And I had injected right in the middle third of the top portion of that nasal labial fold. So you could see how far that kind of progressed. And you have to realize your fillers, as much as they are a gel have the potential of breaking up and they're going to mm -hmm. flow downstream so don't expect it to just be where you injected know your arterial flow pattern and look past that and look downstream from that because you may see that there is an occlusive event happening further down than where you injected absolutely that is a great point that's a great point so if you're injecting nasal labials you start looking at the glabella mm -hmm. you know is anything blanching up in here so that's a really really good point that's a, that's really yeah. really important and you need to know anatomy to address that. So we have our little person here that we kind of <laughs> show anatomy. But it's really important for you to know anatomy and know where the arteries flow. Yeah, um, for sure. And then move them by about 50%. It, I don't think it's 20. I think it's more than 20. Yeah, We've I done so many yeah, cadaver I labs. Mean, you'll never, y this is the thing. You're never going to know exactly no. where your arterial system is. At the end of the day, it's still a blind guess, a blind stick every time you're injecting. Um, you get a sense of areas that potentially constant kind of create bruising all the time. Like I think over the years, like e when I've injected like lateral cheek, like I'm constantly, this is the area that's gonna bruise, this area bruise. And I go and like, ah, this person, it doesn't look like there is one, boom, I hit an artery. <laughs> and then I move a few millimeters back or a few millimeters forward. I'm like, nope, th there's n I don't bruise them. And so you'll get a sense with your experience if you pay attention and cognitively think about it. There are certain areas that definitely bruise consistently for me on majority of the patients, yeah. you know, but of course, as always, Laura says, everything is still <laughs> a, <fluid>. a mishmash <laughs> of whatever <laughs> arterial flow it decides to go into. So, yeah. you know, I, I think it's nice to know in general sense where things are, but you know, you have to 
chop it up to the fact that there's still going to be aberrant vessels or a different pattern to the flow for that patient and not be so worried about it in a sense just know that they are there and to just be cognizant of it yeah. i mean it's just being cognizant that they are there and having this talk is kind of really just keeping in the back of your mind it's kind of like knowing the the way to treat a code blue you hope you never have to deal with the code blue but if you do you at least are prepared for it and so hopefully that's what this kind of discussion is going to be yeah. about so um on our post injection patient protocol that we had up a few minutes a, a couple seconds ago we're going to put that back up for you but zero to 12 hours you can get blanching and that can just be where the, the skin is pale you have slower capillary refill so check both sides like we mentioned now i wanted to mention something that happened to me years back when i used to inject noses and this was something that probably made me really think about not doing noses and i was doing uh, the columella and um, helping to kind of like give it a little bit of structure on nose that was kind of flat and soft and um, all of a sudden I, the tip of the nose started to blanch and um, I stopped injecting and looked at it and I told the patient, I'm like, you know what, let me just stop and like, let me just look at this. And then the blanching went up the nose and then over to the cheek and I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> no, you know, and I just sat there and kind of looked at it. I'm like, okay, if this keeps extending, if it doesn't change, I'm gonna go ahead and go get my Hylinex or my Hyalinidase. And it, I cut there, I kind of watched it for about a minute or so and was praying and getting ready to clean my underwear and um <laughs> and the blanching just kind of it all st kind of started receding and it all just got pink again and the capillary refill was very brisk again and i realized that it was probably an arterial spasm that i had bumped into an artery which have a muscular wall and it had spasmed and kind of inhibited some of the flow and hence it was not an occlusion mm -hmm. and she was perfectly fine but i was like sweat and bullets yep. and but that can happen no, so sure. you don't want to run for the hi higher lawndes immediately you want to kind of watch it you have time we want to make a point that if you have an adverse event like this it's urgent it's you need to kind of think about things and be prepared but it's not emergent right this is not like drop everything on the floor and run it's no you have no. you have time you have time yeah lots of time yeah. i mean it's not a visual. day or two days before yeah. you really have like potential sequelae from not treating it in a sense but uh, uh, vasospasm definitely mm -hmm. i mean i've injected certain areas like lips where you injected it and it just blanches you're like, like ah, crap <laughs> and then you wait and wait and then all of a sudden you see this big bruise form you're like oh okay i really bumped into a big blood vessel yeah. right there and then you know, it, it kind of subsides on its own and it's not a vascular occlusion i mean you definitely still need to assess it do your capillary refill make sure it really isn't a, a vas uh, vascular event and it more is a vasospasm cause caught with a sequelae of a bruise on that aspect of it but i think that you know it, it's something that we're talking about not to necessarily scare you i think the industry when you go to conferences people talk about it almost like it's death <laughs> to somebody. Or like it happens to <laughs> all the time to everybody. <laughs> and how many times has it happened to you? N none. <laughs> and I inject, and I've heard other providers, um, like physicians, will even say like, you know, if you if you haven't gotten a vascular occlusion, you don't inject full time, and you haven't injected enough. I've injected full time for 15 years, and have yet to get a vascular occlusion. So. Um, I keep thinking, am I lucky? And I, I don't think I'm lucky. I think I'm very thoughtful when it's I inject. It's intentional. I would tell you. I'm very you. thoughtful. Not that it can't happen. It can happen tomorrow. And I'm very aware of that. I'm very aware it can happen at any second. So I'm always on that little edge. But I'm very respectful of the tissue. I'm very gentle and I'm very thoughtful and I'm, I'm slow and I'm, I have a, I'm very purposeful. I, I agree. In what I do. I think, you know, the one that I, what I control considered the true vascular occlusion for mm -hmm. me was that when I was going to drop it and I went in because she was like don't waste it you're literally went in I was like all right fine just inject it there was no thought pattern intention it was just like I just want to get it rid of it so that I can move on to the next patient and we're done with the patient um that was my only really big vascular occlusion I had one on a kind of a tip of the nose that kind of was more mm -hmm sticky it's one of my asian patients who they push you to the brink <laughs> of <laughs> yeah. your comfortability and i really didn't want to do it but i was like eh. but i i already had a gut feeling on that aspect of it but 
I honestly think, as you as you're saying, you know, vascular occlusion is really if you are intentional, you're thoughtful about where you're injecting, how you're injecting, you're you're a, you really have this nice feel of what's going on in the mm -hmm. tip, where you mm -hmm. are in the tissue when you aspirate, that you're not moving the needle constantly off the bone. If mm -hmm. you are going to put a big depot, if you're going through the skin and you're fanning and you're moving, I think that that's fine. Your small uh, small aliquots, I think those are fine, but um, if you really are putting a bigger depot, you need to really make sure that you really did do your aspiration correctly into that area. I, you know what? I, there's yeah wounds. This 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 uh, this AI live is not about aspiration, <laughs> and I think if you know me, you know how I feel about that. Um, but that's a that's a good point, yeah, and that can be a whole other AI live. But correct um, aspiration and not faulty aspiration is. Yeah. 1000% the key to um, yeah, we probably should do one helping like with pulling safety. back too fast. You guys, we're <laughs> just we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it on <laughs> faulty aspiration and uh, good, you know, good aspiration techniques. But anyway, but one other thing we wanted to mention, and we want to go to like the second component of, of an occlusion, yes. that's where um, you're still on day one to three, and that's where you're gonna get it could be the first day, second day, third day, where you're really day one or two, pretty much, where you're gonna get that levito reticularis. Yeah. You're gonna get that blanching, the skin starts to model because old blood is kind of stuck in the yeah. tissue and it's not getting carried away. It has a really unique look to Grayish, it. Grayish, it's, it's like a lacy pattern. It's a purpley, like a mm -hmm. scarlet, purpley, soft pattern. It looks like an underlying bruise starting to form. Um, it's a very interesting look to it, that lacy pattern. Definitely, you definitely notice that. Um, and I don't think I, we, do you have a picture of that here? Maybe um, if not, I have a I'll picture of it. I know we have some pictures coming I up. I have my way. pictures. Um, but it's a very distinctive levito reticularis that you really, really do see. Yeah. It. And it's going to be a little bit, um, distal or proximal. It's going to be kind of around the actual injection yeah. point. So like you injected here and you might have some modeling out here or down here. So, um, it can be in more areas and it's going to be pretty much where the feeders are to yeah. the arterial. As you said, you have to understand where the arterial flow is so that you know where more, it's going to flow downstream. It's not going to be for the most part, exactly where you injected or where your needle went in and you're pushing product, unless you pushed a ton of product right into the area that blocked right in that area. If you think about it, I pushed a little bit of product, it's going to really start flow. There's 120 milligrams of pressure flowing behind it. It's going to flow downstream from where it is. So mm -hmm. just be cognizant of that aspect of it. Just because you inject it here doesn't mean that it won't present itself down further downstream. Exactly. Okay. And then the next point that it goes to is usually day three or four. So day three or four is frequently where this gets misdiagnosed as a herpetic lesion or a herpetic breakout yeah. because the skin starts to get little s blisters um, and it looks like impetigo or a, acne. Or a herp or acne breakout or a herpetic breakout. And if somebody has, they might have pain and discomfort at this point, probably quite a bit. And if they go to ER, they're just going to get antivirals and antibiotics and they're yep. not going to get the help that they need. Yep. So it's really important that you know what this looks like. Now we've already got severe ischemia. The, s the face is very resistant to ischemia. Yes. We've got a lot of circulation in our face. So it's really resistant to ischemia, but when it gets to this point, there's a point where it just, it can't recover. Yeah. So when, when we get to the point where you've got some of these little ves vesicular lesions, if we can even break it down and dissolve it at this point, we have a high, very high risk of not getting necrosis or skin sloughing. So you still have you still have a chance of mm -hmm. saving this tissue. No, you do. And we're gonna kind of go through a little bit more later, but this is where we would add the hyperbaric and the we'd add the topical EO2, which is the topical yeah. transcutaneous oxygen, which is th that stuff is amazing. Okay. Yeah. And then day four uh, and beyond, you're yeah. looking at unfortunately tissue necrosis. This is one where you see it, you know, mm -hmm. where I know in the UK they talk about it, you know, estheticians injecting, yeah. not knowing what's going on and passing it off like, oh, you'll be fine. It's just a little bit of something. And it really actually is a vascular occlusion that has now started to necrose. And tissue necrosis is essentially just death to the tissue. Yeah. And sometimes and by the time they get to a clinic <coughs> that's willing to help these people, they might be beyond, beyond um, help or yeah. they might already have some necrosis going on. Yeah. So you just, w these are the things you just want to be cognizant of, you know, explain to your patients of what you're looking for 
you know, I know Lori has her patients stay at least a day if they're coming from out of town. I do. Just in case, you know, because you never know. You know, you could be the best injector and you're still going to potentially have an occasional vascular occlusion. And it's just being cognizant that that can happen and just being having that little safety net. Yeah. And, so I, and like if like I say, I like like Gideon was saying, if if somebody's flying into you to be treated uh, or coming from a long ways away, please, please make them stay at least 24 hours with you at least. Um, like we're 20 minutes from Disneyland here. So I'm like, hey, go to Disneyland, take the family. <laughs> um, stay 24 hours. Don't fly in and fly out. I won't treat you if you fly in and fly out. I'm not, if you're back to Florida and I'm in California, I can't treat an issue and it can always happen to any one of us. Mm -hmm. So please make sure your patient is, is nearby so that you can follow up with them and take care of them. Yeah. So in the initial stages of like some, uh, some blanching that you might have, a couple things you wanna do. We want to make sure that we have good circulation to the area. So you want to put on some warm compresses. So yep. you want to massage the area, make sure it's not a vasospasm, put on some warm compresses. We'll go back one slide if you would. Oh. Go put on some warm compresses and um, make, see if you can rule out that vasospasm. And if it continues to show those symptoms, then you're going to go to the, to the kind of evaluate the, the little protocol above. All right. Or below, sorry, <laughs> as we go. Next All right, one. so here's the yeah. protocol. Yeah, non-visual hyaluronidase protocol. So, of course, starting aspirin, you know, you just chew it, swallow it, and mm -hmm. just kind of thin out the blood a little bit. Um, and then warm compress it yeah. for a little bit of time. Try to draw in some circulation into the area um, as you're evaluating it. Remember, don't need to rush through this. You can do it step by step by step mm -hmm. this is not a an angst and there's not a time frame i mean ultimately even if you did this protocol what i what i do is you you check capillary refill and if you're happy with it send them home and then you bring them back the next day and continue checking them mm -hmm. and if you're happy with it you, you know then you can continue then you can send them home and just follow them up just through your uh telephones or emails or something like that but you know if you're still unsure you still have every day to continue to add more hyaluronidase, to add more things to continue to improve the situation if need be. Yeah. So it's not something, you know, I, I try to stress not to, not to not worry about it, but to not freak out about it, I guess it is. Yeah. And it, here <laughs> in America, our hyaluronidase comes in a 150 unit vial. It's already small liquid and it's amount. small. Now in Europe, you guys are really lucky because you have a 1500 unit vial that you mix up. So you can inject a ton more with less volume than we can. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to kind of put it together and we want to kind of throw as much as we can in there. But I want everybody in the US to listen to me. Now, if you even have a small vascular occlusion, let's just say like the top of a little lip, it's just blanched right here, it's just small. You are going to put in four vials in the first the first few minutes you're going to put it, you're going to put in the four, first four vials, like 600 units is what you're going to start with now how many vials do you have on hand right now in your clinic because every 15 minutes you need to throw about four vials in there uh, if you know even if it's a small occlusion so if you're looking at claudio de lorenzi's protocol you're looking at 600 units even for a small area of blanching or okay. vascular occlusion now in uh, my clinic here i always have at least 24 vials of hyaluronidase on hand always so i really beg you guys to please have a lot on hand it's a cheap insurance policy but if you only have like four vials and you think you're good that's going to go away in the first treatment and then where are you going to go to get more and you really need that so it's super yeah. important no it definitely is i mean ultimately um you you just need to have enough to start that process i mean ultimately you want to open up this vascular occlusion mm -hmm. as soon as possible you know luckily the hyaluronidase does traverse through your blood vessels you don't have to inject it into the blood vessel as long as you're surrounding the area it kind of starts to seep in and you start off with your normal uh, un decent amount and you kind of massage the area massage the area is what i like to do just to kind of spread it just to try and start to break up some of that um uh, hopefully the occlusive event that's going on and then you know, let it sit for a little bit. Let the warm compresses put that back on, draw in some new circulation and continue that 
and then wait 15, 20 minutes. I mean, you don't have to do it every 15 minutes. I think you could still do it 30 minutes later. You know, ultimately it's more about just watching how the progression of it is checking the capillary refill when you are about to reevaluate and see whether or not that capillary refill is starting to get back to its brisk nature. It's more comparable to the other side. Those are the things that you're looking for. So it's not something that, you know, there needs to be exactly every 15 minutes. Uh, you know, you can spread it out to 30 minutes, but you want to make sure that you are addressing the uh, vascular occlusion and you are opening it back up. Yeah, and keep in mind that the Harlana days lasts for it does its job within the first 10 minutes it's pretty much 10 minutes it's kind of done beyond that you've got interstitial <coughs> wash away and vascular wash away so it kind of is absorbed and washed away and neutralized in the body so 10 15 minutes if you want to wait 20 30 minutes that's fine but just know you can repeat it more than probably what you think you can repeat it and mm. we do not have anything in research to this date yet that it actually destroys tissue, destroys, uh, is irreversible as far as hyaluronic, hyaluronic uh, acid in the body. So we've heard some rumors out there that it, you know, it takes your own hyaluronic acid away, but we replace that every 24 to 48 yep. hours. So we don't have anything in research that states that this is damaging in any permanent way yet. Um, and I can't see how it would be but you know i think you're a huge area of necrosis on the face is going to give you da be more damaging <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so make sure Slightly. that you kind of you can look at this protocol take a picture of it and just kind of ballpark it you know nothing's written in stone in medicine yep. we've learned that along the way but if you need to put in more put in more you know right. you're in europe have got 1500 units you can slam a lot in there and uh, we take you a lot just longer need to, to mix evaluate together. the area mm -hmm. and the size of it that you need to essentially devascular or revascularize mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because you don't know how many of the blood vessels downstream have been blocked. You may have injected into one, but now it's become this fork and it's traversed down 20 different capillary beds that you need to get opened up. And this is the reason why one small amount of product placed in a small area, I ended up using probably about total of about it took me about eight bottles mm -hmm. um mine's was actually pretty considered pretty quick pretty easy um but i could notice that brisk capillary refill come back very very quickly even after the first dosage on my vascular occlusion that yeah. i had so yeah. you know everyone's is going to be a very different story and you really just need to understand what what the potential downstream effect is you know if you're injecting down through here potentially can go into the the roof of the mouth mm -hmm. and then the tongue area and stuff like that. So, you know, understanding how significant the spread of your product and where that spread is, is, is going to be very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just want to reiterate, um, just to make it very, very clear that when we are putting the hyaluronidase in, we are not trying to recannulate the artery. No, we are trying to flood it and help it um, it kind of just ooze through it just it permeates the vessels yeah. so it goes through the arterial wall and that's how it thins down or softens the hyaluronic acid filler so it diffuses from a higher concentration to a lower concentration so we want that high concentration outside the arterial wall and we want it to diffuse slowly into it to melt that substance you do not need to recannulate your artery which means you can take a cannula and you can just flood up and down and in and out like all the different layers in the skin in the tissue you can ca you can just flood it because you want to get that high concentration in there to go through whatever vessels that hyaluronic acid fillers in okay so just want to be clear right. that you just, just it will right. diffuse through and you're more than welcome to add a little bit of lidocaine sure. not oh yes not please. lido with epi but plain lido, l plain lido because it does hurt yeah. <laughs> if you guys yeah. have started to dissolve people's lips mm -hmm. ooh, that is not nice um so ultimately make sure that maybe add a little bit of lido you can add a little bit of saline whatever you want just to you know make it a little bit more dilute so you get maybe a little bit more spread into the area so that you can get it to cover a bigger area in the uh in when you're trying to do this so um don't you don't need to just inject the hyalinex itself you can actually take it and mix it and give yourself a little bit mm -hmm. more fluid to inject through the area and you just want to bathe the whole area in it and you know after you bathe it massage it and then apply the warm compresses and then 
we'll check them back in 15, 20 minutes yeah. and then redo it if you need to continue to um, open up the more blood vessels. And keep in mind, I hear a lot of people teach that if you're gonna have an occlusion, they're gonna be in pain. When you had your occlusion here, was she hurting at all? No, not at all. So why would people maybe not hurt if you had an early occlusion? Because almost all of our injectables have lidocaine in them. Yep. So pain is generally not gonna be the first thing you see. Mm -hmm. So don't let that be your immediate indicator. Maybe later, after maybe the lidocaine later, wears for off. Sure. But don't let that be your immediate yeah. indicator. Look for circulation. When you're injecting, your eyes should be scanning everywhere. Yeah. Lack of oxygen will yeah. end up causing a lot of pain. Yeah. Can cause a lot of pain later on. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. You guys got this protocol down? Non-visual, there you go. All right, oops, let's go. That's that one. This there we go. So we kind of talked about waiting for capillary refill. Um, you keep repeating the hyaluronidase. days. Now, if it still has a little bit of a sluggish capillary refill and you've repeated the hyaluronidase days several times, um, you're gonna, at one point, you're gonna have to kind of send them home. You're hoping you flooded enough, but you're gonna wanna see them the next day. What we would recommend is consider ordering the EO2 unit, yep. which is, it, it's, it's, top, it's topical. Um, oxygen. Hyper, yes, it's, hyper. It's, 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 it's a concentrated 100% oxygen. It's not hyperbaric, but it's topical transcutaneous oxygen. So mm, it's a yes, patch yes. that you can put on the skin that supplies 100% oxygen to the skin. And we have seen beautiful results yeah. Um, Rochelle out of Arizona and Brittany, w they've all had beautiful results with this. So believe me, that's a f one of the first places I'm going to call if I have an <laughs> occlusion is the EO2 company. Yeah. So they're online. You can look for them. You can definitely look for um, them. You can rent the machine. Yeah. Um, and it's like a little patch that goes mm -hmm. over it. Um, they bring it to the patient's home. It's not expensive and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's good for diabetic foot, foot ulcers, all kinds of stuff. But anyway, the other thing too is um, be aligned with your local hyperbaric chamber. So call around your clinic, find out what hyperbaric chambers you have nearby that are open on you know, maybe weekends or whatever, and make sure that they might be able to get one of your patients in if you needed to, because hyperbaric oxygen is gonna help get oxygen into smaller capillaries. So it's going to put someone under pressure. Usually they'll put them at 2 ATA, which is the equivalent to about 30 feet below sea level. And it's going to put the oxygen under pressure. So when, an, when a gas is under pressure, it will go it diffuse, diffuse more easily more. into a liquid. Yep. And that will get, help the 100% oxygen that they're breathing um, get into the tissue and supersaturate the tissue with a higher amount of oxygen. So that's gonna yeah. help a lot. Yeah, I mean, why? what's going on? It's yeah. lack of oxygen. So if you're putting in some transcutaneous Mm -hmm. hyperbarically you're at least feeding the tissue yeah. with some sort of oxygen so that there is um, less sequelae less potential necrosis of the tissue yeah and, and you so can put them in there one um, every day <clears throat> yeah you can put them in let For them sure. dive every day yeah yeah but the EO2 does great honestly See, I mean I don't necessarily you know unless you get someone who probably is in the necrotic state which you probably need hyperbarics I think if you catch it early enough um, even within the first day or two days, I think the EO2 actually does it's a beautiful the job. The results nowadays. I've seen have been wonderful with yeah. that. Yeah. And that's relatively new. Yeah. So, yeah. And it was made actually for decubitus yeah. ulcers and mm -hmm. uh, more of a medical aspect of it. So, uh, I think it works really, really well. Yeah. And once they get to like a stage where they have some either partial thickness or full thickness tissue necrosis where you've actually got tissue death and it's Ugh. kind of black, you're going to want to be putting yeah. on antivirals, antibiotics. You're going to be wanting to consider some steroids. So, a lot of these things all along the line, even when they get a little some vesicular issues, I'd probably be wanting to throw them on something just preventatively to make sure that we're, that they're covered for any other issues. Yeah. All right. Let's see. We have a question here. Do you need to dilute the Hylinex? Um, in the United States, it comes in a vial. This is an empty box. It comes in a box like this with a little, a little vial and um, it's already liquid. So we don't have to dilute it in, um, in Europe. It comes as a powder and you have to mix it. So it depends on where you are as far as if you need to, if yeah. you need to add um, liquid. Yeah, but when you're injecting it, you don't probably you don't have to adding, you, want to, you don't need to, you do full strength, but mm -hmm. majority of us like to add a little bit of plain Lido into yes. it or a little bit of saline just so that it dilutes it out and you get a little bit more of a diffusion, uh, diffusional aspect yeah. to it. Yeah. So this is a patient that is in Asia and she had a vascular occlusion to her nose. 
which was left unmonitored. Mm -hmm. And you'll see how it became necrotic and you know that little nose tweaking that she wanted to get really turned into a mess. So she ended up having to have a flap um, used to replace, you yeah. know, to replace the nose that was damaged. So what we don't want to do is let something go this far. We want yep. to recognize it and treat it early so that it never gets this far. Yeah, exactly. All right. And these are a couple that have gone too far also. So you guys need to know that any fillers in the glabellar area and the nose, two areas, are the two highest risks of blindness. And we generally don't recommend fillers in the glabella area at all because of the high risk area, yeah. no matter how you know, much anatomy you think you know. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, this girl was left um, untreated. And you know, she's got some eschar there. And look at yep. the nasolabial fold. Um, this one was probably a nasolabial fold and it's gone proximally down where the oral, um, com oral commissure is, which is probably where that superior labial attaches to the facial artery and up into the angular area. So that entire area was left quite a, qu quite a while. And you see where she's got some secondary intention healing there. Mm -hmm. So that, that's gone necrotic. And either it was one of two things. It was not recognized or it was probably a filler that couldn't be dissolved. Yep. Could be one of a couple things yeah, there. Yeah, definitely. And this is the reason why we try to use ones that you can dissolve. Absolutely. <laughs> this is a friend of mine um, who's allowed us to use her photos. And she had uh, a, a Kaha or hyperlute or just Kaha, I'm sorry, injected in the mid face area. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see day one, day two, day, day three. You see the day one. You can't see the picture very well, but she's got a little bit of blanching. Day two, a little hyperemia. It's a little bit of modeling. Day three, more hyperemia. Um, then we go to day six. She's got um, what looks like almost like a herpetic outbreak, right? Mm -hmm. You've got, and then it's a little bit of necrosis. So she had really, really good treatment. She had a lot of um, a lot of really good um, people on her court that really helped her heal from this. It could have been a nightmare with a non-dissolvable um, filler, yep. but this is kind of what's. It's wonderful for her to share this because it kind of shows you the little. Um, pictograph of, of a time sure. dry line of how something like this can occur. For sure. And, you know, one, one of the things that's noted in here is collateral circulation saved the day. Saved her. You have to realize faces do have a lot more vascularity. Yeah. You have it from coming from one side to the other side. And so luckily for us, the face has a ton of uh, vas uh, vascularity to it. So um, it's, not, uh, it's not the end all when you do get an, a, a little bit of issue. So the hope, hope is that you have some good collateral circulation that can help out in those sets. We have some good <coughs> questions. Um, Laura, do we encourage nitropase to the region? No, actually that's really mm -hmm. fallen out of favor, but that's a good question because yep. that was a big thing to do. Yep. And if you think about it, nitropaste is a vasodilator, dilator. not an arterial dilator per se, even though it does drop your blood pressure. Yep. But um, no, we don't recommend that. Basically it's, it's just gonna be hyaluronidase, warm compresses, aspirin, massage. That's yep. and then you add on your topical oxygens or whatever. No, so for it's sure. it's we've simplified it much more nowadays. Yeah, it's protocol. very honestly it's very very yeah. simple. And aspirin and then Hylanex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much is that it. Um, Stacy, are we doing multiple injections into different areas with the hyaluronidase? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean you need to inject the blanket of the area that's affected because you don't know what part of the vascularity is blocked. So the whole goal is you're blindly throwing it out there so that some of the hyaluronidase is getting to all of the blood vessels um, and breaking down the vascular occlusion that's that's happening there. So whether you inject, if it's a smaller one, whether injecting just smallly into there or mine ended up being like this big and I had multiple different um, injection sites and going with Dawn, whether it's a needle or cannula does not matter. You can do either one. Um, of course, if you can do a cannula, potentially maybe you don't bruise them as right. much. And so you I don't agree. get this bruise on top of trying to deal with the fact of uh, trying to <laughs> decrease the vascular occlusion and check capillary refill and all this stuff. But if a needle is all you can do, um, then that's all you can do. But remember, it's not, you know, it's something that we talk about and there's an anxiety with regards to it. And so people may want to rush it. I'm just going to use a needle and just inject, inject. You can take your time and do it like you're doing a filler and, you know, find the right place and then stick your cannula port side in and use the cannula. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, I think that it's um, it's 
fine to use a needle or a cannula. Um, I personally, in those cases, probably would use more of a cannula for s majority of the areas. There are certain areas that are smaller that you're probably s still going to need to use a needle for. But like the nose. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but I think the cannula probably yeah. is going to help because you're not going to potentially bruise them as much yeah. if you're traversing through the tissue. And then tissue. that bruise won't be as w attributed to like a, like a vascular issue yeah, too. So sometimes you get these big purple bruises and it might hide some yep. modeling. Exactly. So probably I, I would probably try to do a cannula to yep. permit that. I, I, yeah. I totally agree. And you need to inject different depths. It's superficial, it's deeper, it's periosteal. You never know what part of the blood vessel it's flown to. Um, and so you want to make sure that you are getting different levels when you are injecting your Hylonex. So Randy, you asked uh, with <coughs> Kaha, how do you treat it since you can't use Hylonex? There's <laughs> nothing that dissolves it. Yeah. Um, I think people hear that sodium thiosulfate or STS dissolves Kaha, but it doesn't. No. It doesn't. There is nothing that dissolves it intravascularly. Yeah. So they're you're doing, just... You're they're just doing studies right now to see, I mean, the yeah. whole goal is, you know, massage massage you're still going to try the highland x i you mean throw the kitchen sink you at throw it. the kitchen sink at it just yeah. to see what you can do i mean um but ultimately yeah you you're just gonna you're gonna try to follow this protocol and try to see what else you can add to it that will that will help potentially break down or move along this kaha if it is in a vascular and piece. then she asked uh, what do we uh, what do we recommend for treatment for vas vascular occlusion from non-dissolvable fillers not using non dissolvable <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, if they're not dissolved, mm. you're just praying for collateral blood flow. Yep. You're going to throw the kitchen Mas sink at it anyway. You're going to put Hylonex in there anyway. It's not going to do anything. You're just going to do gonna anything you can. Massage, heat, heat, warm compresses. Hopefully, the heat vas vasodilates and it flows past that area and it flows out of the area. Yeah, in Europe last year, they had a blindness issue from somebody dissolving fillers in the nose. Had a occlusion in the nose, were dissolving it, and it flowed really retrobulbar. Wow! So they had a blindness issue. They last, really last pushed year really hard to push that I retrograde. Don't I don't know what um, they did. That's but yeah, interesting. Crazy. Yeah. All right. Um, um, let's see. Can we use Hylonex if a patient has a severe bee sting allergy? That's a good question. On a patient that had really bad bee sting allergy, I would, I would, um, you've got, you've got a few hours. I would you have time. skin test them first you can skin and test just them sit for there 10, and, 15 minutes and look and at it. I, we ha I haven't had anybody yet who's had an allergy to, to Hylonex or bee stings, but, or Hyalondase, but I would, I would skin test them first. I would. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any more slides? Yes, we do. Oh. So retinal okay. occlusion. We, we're, we're, we're talking a lot here. <laughs> so you want to document their vision um, and their uh, exam. So you want to look at near vision. Um, you have, oh, you know what I wanted to do real quick? Let me just show them this real quick. Okay. Okay, so this is, I'm, you guys, I'm going to share with you. Okay, come, we'll come out. Okay, I'm going to share with you real quick. This is from my office. This is my occlusion. This is my vascular occlusion um, box. This like is a crash box. It's my crash box. <laughs> it's my crash box. On it, I've got um, my little protocol. Don't ask me for that. <laughs> Everybody asked me for that. I have in here just easy stuff to, to get. I've got heat packs, little heat packs, okay? You squeeze them and they're warm. The other thing that I have are these toe warmers because you can stick open this up on. and stick it on the face and it stays warm for like six hours. So you just don't make sure you burn them, but they're not. They're made for toes. Yeah. But anyway, this keeps it warm for quite a, quite a while. So you can send them home with those. I've got different size needles, 18 gauge, 25 gauge needles. I've got some cannulas and some cannula port sites, some little mm -hmm. port makers. I've got saline. I've got plain lidocaine, plain lidocaine, chewable aspirin, and some syringes. Yep. So that's all I have in here. Pretty simple. But everything is here. If I have an occlusion, I just pick up this box, take it into the room, and I'm good to go. Yeah. I mean, it's nice to have it prepared so that you're not... You know, not that most of the, not that we're trying to say freak out, but you no. know, it's something that you want to have it in a nice prepared way, so it makes it easy for you. You know, and so um, having a nice little occlusion crash cart, it, it, it is really really nice. And she has one for. And then this is um, this vision. one is vision. So this has an ocular emergency kit. Just has vision on the side, and this one's even more simple. Again, I have the protocol on here, and 
the phone number to my, <laughs> to my oculoplastic um, surgeon who um, <laughs> I have in my back pocket who's been so nice to say, if you have a problem, come to me. So you want to have somebody that you can go to that can rescue you who knows how to do some of these um, retro bulbar bar injections. But here's some near, near vision cards. You're going to have a pen light. You're going to have, um, where's my paper bag? Oh, I have this. I don't have a paper bag with me, but I'm going to have them breathe into a bag because I want to increase their CO2 levels to cause vasodilatation. Mm -hmm. So paper bag or a bag for them to breathe into. You've got your near vision cards, some um, needles and some syringes. These are uh, butterflies. Why do I have butterflies in here? Because if I have a, a blindness issue, I am going to take this butterfly and I'm going to try to cannulate the supertrochlear artery yep. and throw some Hylinex in that supertrochlear area, at least Push in that hard. area, to try to get some of the, of the Hyalondase retrobulbarly. Um, I do have retrobulbar cannulas in here. These are retrobulbar cannulas, or they're actually like needles. They say needles, but they're dull. Am I going to use this? No. Mm -mm. This <laughs> is to go with me down to the oculoplastic to let him put it behind the eye. I am not, I've seen you know, with, with Sebastian Cotofana's lectures and things, I've seen what to do, but I don't feel confident enough to not puncture an eyeball or to not cause a problem. So I don't want to cause a hemorrhage in the back of the eye and make things worse. So I have them in here because I don't think the oculoplastic might have retrobulbar cannulas. Saline, lidocaine, um, some syringes, and then take all of your Hylinex with you to the oculoplastic. Just take it out of your fridge and take it with you. Mm -hmm. So that's my ocular box. Okay, there we go. All ahead. right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> so let's go back to the slide. So retinal occlusion protocol, I mean, as Lori says, you do the same thing. Patient breathes back paper bag, increases CO2, causes vasodilatation. So hopefully of the retinal artery, you put them on aspirin. You're calling the oculoplastic, hopefully, that you have in the back pocket and letting them know. And then, of course, hyaluronidase is... is you know, you can say a thousand, you can say two thousand. You just want to get it done as soon as possible. You know, for a blindness to really, really be substantial um, thing, I think you have about half an hour. I think they're saying see. sixty minutes yeah. max, but um, it's really tough to resolve. Yeah, you really, yeah. really, not many, I get mean, not many have gotten resolved. So this is the reason why we try to avoid areas that have a higher potential of a blindness, oops, of a blindness event, my phone. Um, and so, you know, these are the things that we tell you, you can potentially do. And this is maybe for those that mm -hmm. don't have an oculoplastic next, next to them or near them. Um, these are the things that you have to just try on your own. Like Lori said, maybe get that, um, the butterfly needle and try and cannulate this super orbital artery so you can push it and push it the fast and, yeah. so that it goes into the posterior aspect and uh, helps to relieve the retinal artery um, blockage. If there is. Yeah. And so if you guys take a, ca a cadaver course, what I did was I peeled away this area on the cadaver and I took the, c the butterfly and I found out what kind of what direction because the foramen's open medially and inferiorly on most everybody. So kind of take when you on your next cadaver course, take a, a, a little needle or something with you and try to cannulate that foramen and then you'll have like kind of a, a visual yeah. of, of where you might need to go. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, how much Hylinex, Hyaluronidase do you need? It, you, you honestly never know. I mean, you could use a tiny amount and it's able to dissolve it. You could use a ton and it still doesn't dissolve it. I, I think it just comes down to the how much blockage you get, how much, um, how much it actually uh, traverses through into the blood vessel. Uh, what product you use um, definitely yeah. dictates it. You know, yeah. some of the products are a little bit more tightly cross-linked and it's going to take more time and more Hylinex to actually dissolve it down because you're breaking it like a jaw paper, mm -hmm. little by little by little by little. And so you just have to make sure that you understand that. So uh, we can't tell you exactly how much Hyaluronidase is going to dissolve your product. I mean, you can tech technically check this out when you guys are naturally dissolving patients lips and under eyes and things like that naturally when you're dissolving it that gives you an idea but when it comes to this type of issue vascular occlusion you kind of kind of throw as much as you can into the area within reason i think and then sit back and let watch it and let it do its job and then if it didn't work enough 
put a little bit more in and keep working at yeah. it. So uh, I think that that's where you have to be uh, open to understanding there's no right or wrong answer. It's get product in there to yeah. dissolve is really what it is. Um, so anyway, retinal, we kind of talked about the retinal occlusion and have, you have something ready, have something in the back of your mind, how you're going to manage it. Make sure you have a, 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 an ophthalmologist or oculoplastic or somebody near you within about 20 minutes or 15 minutes if you can that you have aligned with that will say, yes, I will take your patients if there's a problem. Be prepared. Be proactive. Don't be reactive. Don't wish you had somebody um, when, the, when the situation occurs. Yep. Okay, so this is the patient that had uh, polymethylmethacrylate um, in her nose area to kind of alter her nose area, and it went retro-retinal, went in the retinal artery, mm. and she's blind. Yep. So, and this is not reversible. So this nope. is, polymethylmethacrylate is kind of a powdered plastic. Yep. So it's not reversible. <laughs> that's sad. All right. So, yeah, that's kind that's of stuff that, hopefully didn't scare you, but, but, <laughs> but know that he's injected for seven, to eight, 18. seven 18 years, I've been, you know, I'm 15-ish, uh, and y you've got, what, two, 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 two small occlusions that were resolved, and I've had none. So just know this isn't as often. When I recently put on my Instagram for people to let me know as far as uh, aspirating, I had a lot of responses on occlusions also, and I started doing statistics on it, and I really realized that average, people have about one occlusion a year, full-time mm. injectors, which was interesting. That's just in the people who responded to me, which was kind of interesting. That's interesting. So, um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll have to do our own study. Right. I mean, there, there's <laughs> something to the way maybe we inject that we don't get as many, because I, I do a ton I mean, of fillers. Yeah. We both do. We both do fillers every day. Yeah, it's it's and it's surprising mm -hmm. because you know they and do use needles that, and I use needles. I use cannulas. I, I mean, ninety five, ninety eight percent of the time I'm needle. So, um, and I'm ninety eight percent of the time cannula, <laughs> and we still do okay. So I think the big thing is um, respect your patient's tissue, feel it. W um, I want you to visualize the tissue that you're filling. Visualize where you're at. Feel what you're at. Intention. Let your hands. Have intention, have purpose, feel the tissue. Know anatomy, go to cadaver courses, know what that cannula or needle is touching. It's really, really important and you're gonna kind of prevent, I think, these problems from occurring and then you won't have to worry about them or very, very rarely. But be prepared. We just want you to be prepared just in case. It might not ever happen, but just Hope in case. Hopefully never does. <laughs> <laughs> but if it does, remember you have time. You have time. It's not something that you need to rush into you know i i think with with all of these vascular occlusion talks out there my my analogy is don't be that person that's worried about getting a vascular occlusion be cognizant that they can happen but don't be injecting with every thought pattern i'm going to get vascular occlusion but getting you're going to probably get a vascular occlusion in that sense it's like a person that you said oh you can drive a car and you're going to get an act you can get into accident and they're looking to avoid an accident well if you're looking to avoid an accident you're probably going to drive into an accident <laughs> yourself right. yeah. so y you know it's just more about getting prepared and as Lori says just be prepared so that if it does happen you know how yeah. to manage it and it's not something that's just going to hit you out of the blue and blow you over so um hopefully that helped you guys yeah, out we yeah. hope that tonight helped you a little bit as far as being prepared and knowing what to look for that was our goal we just like to share kind of what we've learned along the way and what we know and what we've been through mm -hmm. so hopefully that will help you so we will see you guys at the next ai live we'll see you then you guys thanks for joining us bye guys <laughs>